Yeah, and kind of individual, individuals have been sitting online waiting for this to begin. Um, well, we got settled and got coffee and tea, so we're going to kick it off. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Colleen Sorto. I'm the Director of Development Partnerships here at Conservation International, and I sit within CI's Policy Center for Environment and Peace. And I have been invited to join this group today as sort of the masteress of ceremonies, aka the person keeping us on time so that we all get the happy hour at an hour when we're all feeling happy. <laughs> um, with that being said, I'm really excited and honored to have an opportunity to be a part of this event, which is really highlighting great work that ESPA is doing, great work that CI is doing, and really putting emphasis on the partnership that Conservation International and the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation Program has had. And for that, I'm really excited for the four speakers that who are going to come share information with you. After each of them, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give clarifying re reflection questions. And then after all four of the presentations, we'll bring them all back together and and um, facilitate a Q&A with our panelists before we then go into breakout groups and give you all the opportunity to then kind of digest, reflect, and have conversations over a focused question. So like I said, you will be asked to perform and details are forthcoming um, related to the information that our speakers are going to share today. Uh, across the room, we've shared the speaker, the speaker bios so that we can make the most of our time. I'll do a very, very brief introduction for each speaker and, and give them the floor. And with that, I'm going to invite Adrian McKeon, who is our advisor of rights conservation here at Conservation International, who's going to set the stage talking about um, human rights and conservation and really set some context for the discussions we're going to have today. Oh, thanks. Great. Well, hello, everybody. How are you? Good. Yeah, great. Um, so as Colleen said, I'm going to be setting the stage, uh, talking about uh, the intersection of human rights and conservation, and talking a little bit about what types of rights might apply to conservation. Um, so when you see this up here on the screen, human rights and conservation, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Just off the top of your head. What do you Lovely think? Sunset. Huh? Lovely sunset. Lovely sunset. Okay. All right. What about the words? <laughs> on the screen, human rights and conservation. What does that mean to you? What What is just a word or a thought or an idea that comes to mind when you hear those two things together? Equity. Huh? Equity. Equity. Great. Okay. Or conflict. Or conflict. Yeah, definitely. Trade offs. So trade offs. Okay. All right. Land tenure. Land tenure. Great. Okay. Good. So lots of interesting ideas here. So um, as I said, I'm going to be sort of setting the stage and talking about rights um, a little bit more specifically because in conservation we don't often talk about rights explicitly. A lot of times we just talk about benefits or um, human well-being and we don't acknowledge that there are actually inherent rights that people have. Um, and so that means unless we design projects um, explicitly thinking about human rights, we sometimes ignore rights. Um, and if we acknowledge that they exist and we plan for them in our projects, then we have the ability to not only respect them, but to uh, improve people's recognition of their rights. So does anybody know that this is on the screen here? Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes, exactly. And she is holding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and this is the basis of our modern understanding of what human rights are. Um, it was uh, signed in December of 1948. I'm going to read to you a very short quote by one of the drafters, because I think it, it's a really good introduction to um, the idea behind human rights. So this quote is by... Um, Hernan Santa Cruz of Chile, and um, he says, I perceived clearly that I was participating in a truly significant historic event in which a consensus had been reached as to the supreme value of the human person, a value that did not originate in the decision of a worldly power, but rather in the fact of existing, which gave rise to the inalienable right to live free from want and oppression and to fully develop one's personality. In the Great Hall, there was an atmosphere of genuine solidarity and brotherhood among men and women from all latitudes, the likes of which I have not seen in any international setting. Now, if any of you have been to uh, international meetings, to your meetings, you'll probably understand the significance of that. There is very rarely a great consensus or uh, an upswelling of, of common feeling, often that's 
full of confusion or strife. So um, the signing of this was a, a very significant event. So the foundation of human rights are that they're inherent to everybody. Um, and everyone has entitlement to them equally without discrimination. So if we understand that rights are inherent, it still has to be acknowledged for someone uh, in order to have them recognized. So some of the ways in which uh, rights are recognized um, are in international laws and conventions, um, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Declaration um, on Human Rights, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. All of these are ways that rights are recognized and codified internationally. As well as that, there's the constitutions, legislation, regulations at the national level. And we have to also acknowledge, of course, that local customs practices um, give people rights within their communities. Um, and of course, there's things like contracts, um, funding agreements with donors that, that recognize a certain set of rights for certain practices. So if we understand that rights are inherent, but they also have to be written down somewhere, who is responsible for fulfilling them? Have any of you heard the term duty bears before? Some people? Some people know. Okay. You definitely can. So, the word itself is very easy to understand. A duty bearer is someone who is responsible for respecting, for protecting rights, and for fulfilling them. Who do you think that is often? If you, if I as an individual have human rights are inherent to me, who might be responsible for ensuring that I have the ability to access those rights? I'm not going to give you the answer. So must volunteer. Government. Government. Yes. All right. Great. Who else? Employers. Employers, yeah. What about children? Parents. Maybe their parents? Sure. Yeah. Um, so what about NGOs and civil society? Do we have rights uh, or responsibilities to ensure rights? Of course. Um, we have money, we have power, um, we have access to governments. We as, uh, as NGOs, as civil society, we have responsibility as well to ensuring that rights are respected and even more to ensuring um, fulfillment in ways, uh, for example, um, if a government doesn't necessarily uh, fulfill rights, we have responsibility when we can to encourage them to fulfill rights. Um, at the very baseline, of course, we have the responsibility to ensure that we don't infringe upon anybody's rights, um, but we hope to go higher than that. So. There are two types of rights um, that people have. The first is procedural rights. So these are things, as the word says, procedural. Uh, it is usually something related to a process. So access to environmental information, um, help the right to participate in public discussion and make decisions about environmental uh, management that will affect you, access to justice or grievance mechanisms, things that allow you to access a the second type is substantive rights. So these are things that, like, uh, everyone has a right to life, to privacy, to health, um, access to clean water and freedom from hunger, um, a freedom from discrimination, the right to a healthy and safe environment. Um, and so how do you think these two things relate? Um, so I have, I have an example here to give you. So the right to water is a substantive right. But the government has the right to ensure that people have access to the water. So that could be the procedural part of it. So sometimes these things work together. So what other rights, either procedural or substantive, do you think that conservation can influence or has, the, uh, has a, an obligation to help fulfill? Which one? Substantive. Okay, what's what's the specific one that you can think of? Okay, in I work for UKA, okay. so let's take for example, uh, we are in some sub-Saharan African countries mm -hmm. uh, that could give uh, right to self-determination, 
Mm-hmm. An number of people, not only in Africa, but yep. a number of areas, you know, a sense of self identification and determination, which is intrinsically uh, bound with the natural environment yep. and health. Uh, clean water, you know, in mm-hmm. some areas, conservation, yep. equal sure. ecosystem services, equal medicinal plants, mm-hmm. and, and equal clean water, yep. freedom from hunger, because, uh, you know, Forest can be so Okay, great. Anyone have any other examples? Maybe a procedural, right? What is something that you think of when you think of procedural? I can go back to that one. Agreements. All right, agreements. Yeah, exactly. Agreements mechanism. Just because um, we're doing good doesn't mean we all never do harm, right? So the ability for people. That we're working with that are impacted by our projects to seek grievance or seek redress from us certainly is a procedure right that conservation has to fulfill other thoughts benefit sharing benefit sharing yeah absolutely in what particular sounds are you thinking there's lots well, of it can be types. anything from uh, co-management to uh, to revenue sharing to um, uh, untangible benefits yep great Clean air, clean water. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, no, oh, that wasn't supposed to come together. Yeah. Okay, so, um, as you all said, there are a lot of different types of rights that conservation has the, the need, the ability to address. And, um, and I'm going to give two sets of examples <coughs> here. Um, so, one is about reducing is about increasing benefits. So the first uh, three things that are up here are all um, headlines from newspapers recently. So one says, um, Native people's rights are violated in the name of conservation. Um, Brazilian government evicts communities that best preserve the rainforest. Um, bank financing tied to deforestation and rights violations for Pama in Indonesia. So when we don't consider the impacts that conservation can have, there can be negative consequences. But at the same time, um, there are another set of headlines which are equally true. So women in wetlands, the hidden side of conservation solutions, community rights, a key to conservation in Central America, and uh, indigenous groups could be the key to combating global deforestation. So not only does conservation have the ability to uh, improve people's access to their rights, it also has the ability to improve our conservation outcomes. So both things are true. Okay. So you're thinking to yourself, great, rights are wonderful, conservation, what's the connection, what are you guys doing about it, how is conservation uh, organizations, what are they working on uh, towards increasing people's access uh, to rights. So there's something called the Conservation Initiative on Human Rights, which was created in 2009. Uh, with all of these organizations up here, I'm going to just read them in case people in the back can't see the um, logo. So BirdLife International, uh, Conservation International, IUCN, The Nature Conservancy, um, Flora and Fauna, uh, WWF, and the Wildlife Conservation Society, as well as um, Wetlands International was a founding member, although they no longer um, participate. So in 2009, um, all of these organizations came together and said, we need to do something collectively to ensure that we're working together and speaking with one voice on issues related to human rights and conservation. Um, So one of the first things that we did was to create a set of principles that all of the organizations agreed to follow and to incorporate into their own work. So they are uh, respect human rights, um, promote human rights and human well-being within conservation programs, uh, protect the vulnerable, and encourage good governance. So each of us decided in our own way um, how to incorporate these principles into our practice. uh, Because as all of us know, principles alone uh, will not change behavior. So this was only a first step. So what we here at CI have done, I'll tell with you very briefly. Um, So this up here is CI's mission statement. Um, So building upon a strong foundation of science, partnership, and field demonstrations, CI empowers societies to responsibly and sustainably care for nature, our global biodiversity, for the well-being of humanity. 
So I've highlighted um, in blue the parts that are particularly relevant to human rights. So empowering societies, um, the well-being of humanity. And um, we currently have these eight, I can count, policies, um, which are related to human rights. Um, so they are, we have policies on gender, on uh, involuntary settlement, on the protection of vulnerable populations, um, on child protection, uh, indigenous peoples and MCI, um, partnerships, research ethics, and anti-trafficking. So these policies are um, what I see as ways to ensure that human rights are respected in all of our work and give um, our staff a way to guide their thoughts and behaviors when working with communities. So I'm going to stop there. Um, one of my colleagues, you, is going to be talking about some of CI's work related to um, uh, governance of protected areas and give more examples of what we're actually doing. So this was just sort of an interview or an introduction to, um, to rights. And if you have any questions about things covered here, then I'm happy to answer them. As Colleen said, we'll take a few clarifying questions and have more time for discussion afterwards. Anyone have any questions they want to put into the, the pending list, which we'll all address together? Have you had enough copy? Have you not had enough presentations yet? All right, Aiden, we're just getting warmed up, but I promise. Oh, yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how these concepts of um, human rights based approaches to conservation, how it relates to the sustainable development goals? I'm not entirely familiar with the SDGs, but I believe okay. that there is a component in there about human rights and conservation. Thank you. That will kick us off when we transition to discussion. Anyone else like to put a, a pending question for when we? I promise you'll see the utility of why I'm pulling it after each speaker once we get there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yep. uh, can you get the next slide up? Yeah. Thanks. So as we make the transition, we're going to kind of Adrian really setting the, the context on the people portion of what we're sitting here to look at today. And now sort of pivoting to protected areas, we have the benefit of having um, Kate Schreckenberg, the Director of Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation Program, who's going to look at, um, is it 120 pro projects under ESPA's work and, and pulling out some of the lessons and things we've learned, which will probably touch on some of these themes and maybe even get us even deeper. So, is that? Go over there? Yeah. I, so Maybe. Yeah, that's the right one. Anyone that's got on it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, so the program that I, I lead at the moment, the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation Program, is a research program uh, funded by the UK government. And Alex is here. He's been one of the leading <coughs> proponents of this program. Uh, together, uh, so the Department for International Development, which has a, a strong focus on impact. Um, so we've with two of the research councils in the UK, the Natural Environment Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council. So from the beginning, it's been a, a program that is trying to fund research that uh, is both cutting edge, but also has strong development impact. And I've been leading it for the last year of its nine years or so, uh, and we've been doing a synthesis of the findings across all those different projects, 120 projects as, uh, or more, in fact, that, as Colleen mentioned. And uh, one of the areas that um, we've had a synthesis done is, is on all the work that's relevant to protected areas under this project. And in fact, the, um, the ESPA impact project looked beyond ESPA itself, but also drew on the broader literature uh, in this area of ecosystem services and poverty alleviation, but with a, a focus uh, taken out of an ESPA perspective. I'll, I'll go through the methods in a minute. Um, so I'm going to present the results of that overarching synthesis, but I'm going to intersperse with some um, specific examples from particular ESPA projects, uh, individual projects that kind of highlight some of the issues that, that uh, I'll be mentioning. And the approach that the, the synthesis project took was to look at some common narratives, uh, uh, we call them myths in, in the um, kind of invite, but actually more sort of commonly held assumptions and narratives around the relationship between poverty um, and uh, conservation and particularly protected areas. Uh, why is that important uh, to understand those narratives? Because they are very pervasive. Um, they 
ring well. They, you know, they, they are often, they feel intuitive and they can very much underpin the policies and then the practice of organizations, whether government or, or non-government in NGOs. And one example from um, an ESPA project by uh, Kate Brown and, and Thomas Shanyu, they, they were working in the Philippines in three marine protected areas, and they were looking at um, the difference between the discourse that was used when the marine protected areas were set up and what then happened in, in practice uh, several years down the line. And the, the protected areas, the you know the discourse that was uh, was used, the narrative that was used to convince people to participate was that there would be quite a lot of economic benefit for households. Uh, the marine protected areas would increase the fish stock, there'd be spillover effect, and so the fishermen would be able to to fish more and have more income, even though there'd be a restricted area where they couldn't fish. Um, actually, what happened was that because of various changes in the environment, but also institutional changes where uh, the people who were fishing and their types of fishing gear changed. Um, the actual benefits that came back to households were very small and they weren't equitably distributed. So that led to a lot of upset. People were, you know, understandably kind of, uh, it wasn't what they were expecting. And so the overall uh, support for the enterprise kind of diminished. And in talking, doing focus groups and so on with, with uh, the fisher folk in that area, the researchers found that really what motivated people in a more sustainable way to support conservation over the longer term was not this idea of individual benefit for households, but more community level benefits and, and understanding this resource, the marine protected area as a resource for the future that would maintain their fish supplies for the whole community into the future. And their argument as a result of this research was that, you know, had the creation of the MPAs set out with this much more realistic, possibly harder to measure, but much more realistic set of narratives around longer term community uh, level benefits, then they wouldn't have had the backlash of, of the disappointment of people who were expecting something that they didn't then get. So understanding narratives is really important to, you know, to get uh, set things up in a way and manage them in a way that is, is sustainable in the longer term. So the, the uh, synthesis project uh, identifying five common assumptions, I'll be going through those in a minute, and they identify those assumptions about the links between protected areas um, and human well-being uh, through various workshops and also through looking at websites like CI's website, for example, to see you know, how uh, NGOs um, justify their, uh, their investment in protected areas um, and livelihoods. And then uh, there, were, uh, there was a systematic review of papers. Um, there was a systematic review done by McKinnon et al, uh, which published in 2016, some of you might know it, and they had reviewed up to 2014. So this project looked, used the same search criteria, but went on 2014 onwards, um, looked at the additional papers, started out with 8,000 papers, uh, and then narrowed them down and uh, through various exclusion criteria, only looking at low and low middle income countries, for example. Um, and in the end, uh, narrowed it down to 100 papers that dealt with these five, 20 each for, for each of the five narratives, uh, and really drilled down deeply to understand how these narratives actually worked in practice and was there any evidence for them or not. And that was supplemented with expert interviews, and those interviews were mostly of researchers and practitioners who were involved with, with S projects in some way. And one of the first things that became clear from the beginning of this project was the need to uh, to define and think about how the project defined well-being and, and the impact on well-being. Uh, and really, the, one of the realizations was that these social dimensions of conservation are very poorly conceptualized. Um, there's still too much of a focus on income measurements uh, and assets sometimes, which are often not appropriate for uh, people in protected areas that are very remote, very biodiverse, um, and where culture and nature are very highly intertwined. So it may be that you know, income um, measures are not terribly relevant uh, when, you don't, when you're not integrated into the market economy, for example. So um, across all of ESPA, not just the work around conservation, uh, there was really a focus on uh, looking at well-being um, in a much broader way and thinking about it not just in the kind of objective uh, dimensions like food security and health and so on, but also the subjective you know, how people themselves self-evaluate outcomes of interventions and linking in the social cultural norms and values, and also the relational elements of well-being, which is, you know, brings it all together, the power relations between stakeholders, the relations between 
uh, different social groups, but also the relations uh, in the conservation context between people and their environments and how that makes them feel a sense of place and so on. And briefly, this, you know, this project, the synthesis project, felt that the establishment of protected areas affected well-being uh, in a number of different, potentially in different ways. So uh, development activities both within the protected area and outside the protected area that are uh, set in train alongside of, uh, the establishment of a protected area uh, can have an impact. Uh, the actual management of the ecosystem and restrictions that might be imposed as a result of that um, also have an impact. And then the institutions that are set up, the governance institutions, can also have an impact uh, on um, people's well-being. So all of those different elements were considered when analyzing the, um, the different uh, journal papers and also the interviews. So the first of the narratives that uh, the project looked at was because poor people are disproportionately dependent on ecosystem services, protected areas are a means to reduce poverty. So thinking about the fact that protected areas can improve, like the, the spillover effect, improve the, the stocks and flows of different ecosystem services that poor people are dependent on, and so uh, you know, improving their well-being. But for that one, the evidence was actually quite mixed in the papers that um, were analyzed, and it was very clear that protected areas could only help poor people if they were still able to access those resources from the, from the protected areas. Uh, and the poorest people tend to be the ones who are most negatively affected by the establishment of a protected area, and impacts can be, you know, very, very wide indeed. Um, Adrian's already mentioned some of them, so it can be on, you know, economic well-being, it can be on people's sense of security, uh, autonomy, their social relations, their cultural practices, and so on. So very wide set of uh, types of impacts. Um, and I'll come to a couple of examples in a minute once I've talked through a few more of the uh, different <coughs> uh, narratives. So the second narrative starts off the same, you know, as poor people are disproportionately dependent on ecosystem services, but the second half is different, improving their material well-being will reduce pressure on protected areas. So this one sees poor people as being the main threat to protected areas and says, okay, if we can divert them with uh, activities uh, that improve their livelihoods, then uh, it'll mean that there's less pressure on the protected areas. Uh, and that underpins a lot of alternative livelihood kind of uh, interventions that conservation organizations uh, often implement. Um, but here also there's very little evidence in the journals we looked at, in the papers we looked at, um, that that uh, is actually true. Um, very often the poor are extremely dependent on a protected area and that limits their flexibility to engage in other kinds of activities. Uh, so the fisher example again, if they're you know totally dependent on, on fishing and they're no longer allowed to fish, well they're not necessarily easily going to be able to transfer to tourism, for example, if that's what you're, you're going to offer them uh, in, in its place. And the particular <coughs> problem with this is, is the fact that it blames the poor for degradation of protected areas and it ignores the fact that actually a lot of the activities might have to target richer people and, and better off people and perhaps people who are distant from the protected area who are actually behind uh, a lot of the uh, degradation. Our third narrative uh, was that, okay, there are unavoidable costs of protected areas, but they can actually be mitigated by proper compensation. And um, there we found, I think, across the board, really, that the economic benefits provided through compensation projects are very important, often, uh, but they are rarely sufficient. Um, compensation is not commensurate um, for uh, the loss of life in particular. So you know, Phil uh, has worked a great deal in Kenya, and me too, and, and there, you know, there's a, there's a right, um, can I go back to your rights, that you should be compensated for any loss of life, uh, but there's never been a single payment um, on that account so over, I don't know how long that right has existed, 10 years or something. Um, so, you know, and people do lose their lives or they lose their crops and so on and, and the compensation is not sufficient. And here are some examples from Madagascar. Um, so this is a, a project where uh, it's actually a biodiversity offset. So the Ambatavi nickel mine, one of the biggest mines in, in the world, um, it has to, Good, the fact that it's creating a, a big mess where it's extracting the nickel and, and it pays for a protected area uh, in a different place. And the study looked at 
the impact of that protected area. And uh, one of the, the papers that has come out of this, the first one, the 2017 paper, is called Bittersweet, because actually people liked some of the um, alternative livelihood activities that were coming, but they weren't sufficient and they didn't come on time. Things like uh, coffee trees, you know, they only start maturing after three years and people need the benefits right away as soon as they're no longer able to do their shifted cultivation, uh, which was the, the main issue around here. But what I thought was quite interesting about this was that, you know, when you ask people uh, at the local level about where the costs and benefits lie of the offset, um, they found that, you know, the household suffered almost entirely negative and slightly negative impacts and very few positive impacts. Uh, the village was also majority negative, but for Madagascar, they saw that the offset was largely positive. So it's not that they don't um, see and understand the positives of, of conservation, it's that they're not happy about the cost that they're having to bear in order to achieve those positives at national level. And this was a related project also in Madagascar. Uh, this was one that was where CI was one of the, the main partners, in fact. Um, a fairly new protected area, the CAS protected area, and because it was <coughs> funded with World Bank money, there was a, a process of having to identify the PAPs, the project affected persons, and offer them uh, compensation. So the research project looked at who had been identified as a PAP, um, a project affected person, uh, and relative to who should have been identified as a project affected person, and they found that if you were a household with a member in a community forest association, uh, not just in the association, but on the executive board, so the chair, the secretary, the treasurer. Um, if you had higher food security, if you were at the higher food security end of the spectrum, and if you lived closer to a motorable road, so you were better connected and not so close to the forest and not so reliant on the forest, then you were 20 times more likely to be identified as a PAP than the people at the opposite end of the spectrum, away from the roads, with very low food security and with no connection to the, the community forestry associations. So completely counterintuitive. Um, and only 50% of the people who, according to the, the project's research, should have fallen into the category of being identified, had been identified. And then um, the World Bank's own reports showed that only 50% of the people they had identified actually got compensated in the end. So only a quarter of the people who could have, really should have been identified, ever got any compensation. And the medium net pre uh, present value of opportunity costs $2,500 per household. Multiply that up by the three to 4,000 households um, concerned, and, and you're looking at the cost locally born of seven to $10 million, and the actual one-off compensation payment to people is a quarter of a million dollars. So a huge disparity uh, right there. And coming back to the issue of who's responsible and who's accountable, it's quite interesting because the World Bank was asking for this to be done and was rushing for it to be done quickly. The money had to be spent really fast. CI employed a consultant. The consultant had to do all of this in three months. There were whole villages that we discovered that were right in, in the protected area that weren't ever, none of them were identified as PAPs at all. So they never even went to those villages. Um, but you know, it's a huge area. So three months is totally insufficient. And you know, so who's responsible? Is it the consultant for doing a bad job? Is it CI for rushing them or passing on the rush that they're you know, experiencing from the World Bank? You know, who's responsible there for actually making sure that the job is done well? So the fourth narrative um, was that participation in protected area governance is a route to sustainable conservation. And that one we actually found, uh, there was more positive evidence for that one. Um, as one would hope, you know, participation is actually a, a good thing um, and does mean that you can uh, potentially have more sustainable uh, outcomes because people are engaged in the decision making process. Um, but the real problem here was that a lot of the case studies that talked about participation highlighted the fact that it wasn't meaningful and we're just paying, you know, projects were paying lip service to participation, particularly for the more marginalized and for women. This is one of the ESPA case studies that uh, was positive. Uh, so um, Nicole Grosskamp was working in Tanzania, looking at uh, community-based forest management. And this obviously is, has devolved governance. So a lot of participation by local people in this process. 
and she looked at four villages which had CBFM, four villages that didn't. She did a household survey using locally defined indicators of well-being and found that there wasn't any difference between the, the four villages with CBFM and those without. So you think, okay, no material benefits of CBFM, yet there was a real strong support for CBFM in the four CBFM villages, and that was because of, it comes back a little bit to the, the fishing, the MPA example at the beginning, it was, it was this idea that they were less interested in the individual household benefits. It was the longer term benefits. You know, they value the, the forest as a future source of products. Um, it also secures the forest for them. It excludes, it enables them to exclude outsiders. So that's a really important right that they are now able to have. And they were very proud, this is the governance side of things, you know, they're recognized, people come and visit them to see what they're doing, and they're recognized for, you know, their good conservation efforts, and, and that makes them proud, proud. So these are things that you wouldn't normally try, you know, wouldn't normally think of measuring, um, but shows that uh, participation in some respects can be a really good thing. This is an example of the opposite, also in Tanzania, the wildlife management areas. Um, where these have now been going for nearly 20 years and, and there's a policy brief about this particular case study over there that you can pick up um, later on. And there's an awful lot of um, kickback against them from local communities. And part of that, you know, this uh, set of studies here highlights that part of that goes all the way back to how they were set up again, uh, kind of raising false expectations and um, set up in such a way that local communities never really understood, they didn't have the proper information, that once they entered into this agreement, that kind of relieved them of any right to have further say about land use. Um, and there's no option, there are some, I think they, they were looking at one WMA that had like 11 communities in it, where one has been protesting the whole time, they didn't want to be in there, but they couldn't get out of it anymore because it required all 11 communities to, to be in. The equal benefit sharing, back to this issue of benefit sharing, was set up at the beginning that all villages would benefit equally from the tourism revenue. But there are some villages who really suffer much, much more from uh, elephants uh, destroying their crops, and yet they don't get more than the villages who, who just because of ecological reasons, uh, don't have that elephant damage. So, and there's no process for them to negotiate uh, and adapt. So one of the, the problems with the, the procedure here is that there's not effective participation, it wasn't effective participation at the beginning and that there isn't effective participation now, uh, there isn't a grievance mechanism and there's not good negotiation and the accountability in the institution seems to be upward rather than downward to the residents. The fifth um, and last of the narratives uh, was that resource tenure uh, underpins improved conservation outcomes in and around protected areas. And again, this is this is a double-edged sword. There's definitely lots of really good positive evidence that this is uh, important. Um, but we have to look at uh, which resource we're talking about. You know, is, is it tenure of the land, the trees, the underground resource? Um, and what is the, uh, uh, what kind of tenure are you looking at? Are you looking at customary tenure or are you looking at tenure reform, which can sometimes really undermine uh, the rights of landless um, marginalizing um, the women. So finally in conclusion then, a lot of these underlying assumptions um, are not borne out by the body of evidence uh, from the research um, and really to achieve more effective and equitable conservation outcomes requires shifting away from looking for win-win narratives but actually thinking about the fact that there are always going to be trade-offs uh, and being a bit more honest about that. Uh, and shifting also away from this very simplistic focus on income-based poverty assessments and thinking about the, the broader concern uh, of well-being, and then giving much more emphasis to an equitable process uh, over outcomes. And I think on the issue of process, then hand over to Phil, because he's done quite a lot of the work uh, that has looked much more at the equity uh, side things, and we'll talk more about the process. So before we go to Phil, anyone have a question you'd like to get in the cave? Uh, she's dropped a lot of information on us. I actually gave you a few more minutes because I think you've presented some some things that we all need to mull over. How many in this room come from sort of the conservation perspective or would identify yourself as it? There's a lot for us to think about in there, huh? 
a, a lot of things that are sort of like tried and true statements that we've marched to that really challenge what the future of conservation looks like and our areas for improvement. So questions for Kate before we pay to fill all of Tim and Mark. And yeah, then I, quick question on, on the definition of protected areas. You know, for hard border okay. protected area, yeah. areas where, where all we're talking about is, is gate fees and, and maybe jobs to uh, ICDB full management kinds of things. If one looked at that continuum, if God willing your, your database was sufficient, to me, some of the conclusions would be valid for one end of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum. And by bundling um, all of the evidence into protected area, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to, when you say protected area, what did the yeah. study group So mean? we'll go for our clarity and then there's yeah. probably yeah. some reflection points related yeah. to that. Yeah. So. Yeah, thanks, this is fascinating. We, I work a lot with USA and these are a lot of the things they talk about, a lot of justifications for conservation actions. So it's really nice to see evidence on it. I guess I'm wondering about the link between fees and failures in conservation schemes. So presumably if you're selling protected area for a particular you know, reason, it's gonna yield economic benefits or things like that, and then it ends up being hugely costly, eventually that protected area is not gonna happen in the future for your conservation scheme. So I'm wondering, um, I'm just kind of curious about that connection, what happens after these, these stories fall apart, does it lead to failures in uh, we're going to touch on that some more in some of the presenters as well. And then a question in the... Oh, exactly the same question about the definition. So I'm, I'm going to put times two, so we know that that one... I can give a quick answer on the definitional issue. Yeah. I will allow you a clarifying, especially because we as presenters are not to have that, that procedural point. Um, I can just tell you that the search terms that were used by, by the, the project uh, included protected areas and all area-based conservation. So it's a broader mm -hmm. definition, and we can come back to implications maybe in the panel discussion. Thank you. So with that, um, Kate really sets us up nicely to turn to Phil Franks, the senior researcher from the International Institute for Environment and Development. And Phil is going to talk to us about <coughs> approaches to conservation from an equity and justice perspective. And also make the case for changing the approach. Yes. OK, so. The first thing is to talk about some of the work that's been done to understand equity in the context of protected area management and governance and conservation. Much of it funded by ESPA over the years, some of which Kate was directly involved in. Um, and my goal for that will come to that in a minute. Um, why is equity important in conservation? Um, a little bit of the experience, if you like, of what is the kind of main stream approach to the social dimension of conservation, which tends to be focused around livelihoods and livelihood frameworks. And lastly, the, as I said, the argument for maybe shifting from a, a livelihoods based approach to more of an equity based approach and what that might mean. So, protected areas are uh, just some key concepts that we need to be clear about, even within the notion of protected areas, before you get to a broader idea of. Uh, other other conservation areas. The IUCN categorization of protected areas has a whole range of different classifications based on management objectives and governance types. So I'm talking about anything within that matrix, which can include at the one extreme state managed areas which really have no engagement with local communities to indigenous and community conserved areas. Although there's some shifting of sort of definitions and, and that sort of likely to be hived off is being hived off actually into a separate category rather than being called protected areas in sort of debate on that. But the term social out social impact or social outcome, uh, sometimes I find talking to economists that they think that's not the same thing as economic outcome. So from a, someone who does social impact assessment or works in social science, social impact or social outcome includes anything that has an impact on society at large or well-being of individual households and individual people, including cultural impacts and economic impacts. And equity in the plain English, meaning fairness, or, and is, can be considered to be a, a pretty much identical to the concepts of social justice and inclusion. But if you take a legal perspective, for example, there are differences about people, those concepts. But for most people we work with, they're not lawyers, 
and they, uh, it's best to explain that these terms are largely the same, mean the same thing. So, um, so the, Kate um, and, and ourselves, Kate, other, many other colleagues and ourselves have been through a process over the last three years of developing a framework to help us understand what equity means in the context of conservation. And I'll come back to, I mean, the history of this goes back a long time, and I'll come back to why we think this is an important question. But first, I'll try to explain where we got to with this. Um, so it started off with this, with reviewing related literature, much, much of it, I, as I said, originated from the funded research, um, a meeting to elaborate Kind of at least a set of principles under each equity dimension. And I'll come back to what that means in a minute, but essentially to start the unpacking. Field work um, to validate the framework that we were developing, which involved interviews, largely these fact interviews with individual organizations involved in protected areas, focus group with communities, another workshop to sort of pull it together and revise the framework. Discussions at the World Conservation Congress a couple of years ago. There's a paper that we published, case lead author in the Parks Journal, just here somewhere, called Unpacking um, Equity for Protected Area Conservation. Um, and then we've gone a little further in unpacking it, and I'll explain that in a second, and, uh, and validating, which means checking that actually the theory that we are working on actually makes sense and aligns with the way people see it in the field. So what does this framework look like? Uh, so essentially the first level of unpacking is that, is that there are three dimensions of equity uh, and this is not just in protected areas, this could apply from the work originates in, in the work on environmental justice and in the work on that uh, as we are funded on payments for ecosystem services. But this notion that equity has a distributive dimension, a procedural dimension, and recognition. So recognition being about respecting rights. This is a point of view, but yeah, respecting rights, and identities, knowledge systems, values, and institutions of different actors. Procedure being all about um, participation, transparency, accountability, and dispute resolution. Is sort of the core of governance issues there. And then distribution being about how the allocation of benefits and costs, uh, how they're allocated amongst the different actors or stakeholders. We use the word actors, or I use the word actors simply as a shorthand for rights holders and stakeholders, uh, because uh, it's hard to say rights holders and stakeholders every time. Um, so, so that's the first level of unpacking, and that, uh, as I say, is based on theory, um, there's a legal perspective, there's a, and, and also empirical research. Uh, and the interesting bit I guess comes where you take it to the next stage of saying what is within those three dimensions. And so this is um, the first kind of cut of the unpacking beyond that. So recognition essentially around human rights, land and resource rights, there's particular rights of indigenous peoples, including free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, recognition of actors themselves and their interests, and rec recognition of actors' culture, knowledge, and values. <coughs> and then procedure, as I said, being about participation, transparency, accountability, and dispute resolution. And distribution being about, um, well, first of all, uh, understanding how costs and benefits are, are, are distributed. That's more through an assessment type of process. And then there are two parts to this. One is the cost side, um, which is in the context of protected areas, expressed as effective <coughs> mitigation measures. Mitigation being measures to either avoid the negative impact or at least reduce it uh, by measures that directly reduce the damage or compensation or ultimately offsetting if it's a biodiversity. I'm not sure you can have a social offset. Right? It would essentially mean that you um, you benefit, give benefits to some other people because um, the, in, to compensate another lot of people for the damage they've incurred, which is not an acceptable 
the uh, principle. So um, those are the, and, then, and the other side of it is on the positive side, on the benefit side, that equity, uh, equi uh, benefits should be equitably shared. And, and what this slide doesn't show is the all important um, debt uh, unpacking here of what equitably mm -hmm. means in this context. And it can mean uh, equally, that everybody gets the same. Or it can mean that poor people disproportionately benefit. That's often called the pro poor approach. Or it could mean those suffering costs get compensated, they get priority. Or those contributing most to conservation get it as a reward or incentive for conservation. Those are all very different ways of defining equity in terms of how benefits are shared. They're all fair in a certain context. Um, and often that level of uh, that distinction is not made and you end up with fudge, uh, which is usually somewhere between being pro poor, sort of targeting poor people and um, either incentives or compensating costs. And usually it's sort of basically doesn't hit any of the objections because it's so sort of fuzzy. So anyway, those are the, the, the principles. And one of the things I want to show here is how is the relationship between equity and, and, and established principles of good governance. Because the point is that equity isn't anything new. Uh, we've been working with aspects of equity for, for many years. And, for, and here, for example, this is the framework that IUCN has uh, developed and is widely recognized and used for good governance of protected areas where essentially you have these five main headings, if you like, and underneath the headings there are also lots of more specific um, issues. So uh, the equity principles, these recognition ones, you would have to see the content of each of these boxes mm -hmm. to, to know but that's, a, that's available in, that, in IUCN. Uh, publications. Uh, the procedure ones map onto those like that and the distribution ones map like that, from which it's quite clear that the e equity relates to th these three main categories. These ones are much more about the performance, defining the goals of the, con of the protected area and measuring its progress in conservation terms and and also the relationships between different stakeholders and collaboration um, and direction is about having a strategic plan, a management plan, I mean, and setting uh, targets and those sorts of things. They're more related to the effectiveness side uh, of um, conservation than the equity side. But the point from this is to, is to emphasize that equity is really very close uh, it maps directly onto these three. But I would, with a caveat, that this is how it looks in the context of natural resource management and conservation. Uh, it would not look the same if you had principles for good corporate governance, which do not emphasize very much about equity. Um, I have no, well, very little emphasis on equity. So it is, it's not entirely coincidental. Um, that these map so directly onto the governments. It's obviously not, not a coincidence. Um, uh, and it works also because the IUCN frame of governance is very broad, includes issues of distributive equity um, around who's getting what benefit or who's incurring what cost and what is being done about it and, and rights as well. So everything here finds a place within the existing governance framework of IUCN. Now, one of the, so we have, um, believe that this notion of equity is very helpful and could uh, enable us to be m rather more effective in, the co in working in the social dimension of conservation, both in terms of conservation outcomes and social outcomes. Um, and there is a lot of interest now in the CBD in the notion of equity. It's already there in the Aichi Talit 11, which says that protected areas, it's all about expanding the percentage of the earth uh, service covered in protected areas, but those protected areas should be effectively and equitably managed. And there's a lot of interest in trying to understand, sort of eight years after the target was developed, what does that actually mean? 
and how would we measure if we were making progress on equity? So there's kind of a, and, and also the, as a, the SDGs have a lot to say about equity and inequity and inequality. And so there's a kind of quite enabling um, sort of political environment at the moment for well, anything that's related to equity. But of course, equity is something relatively new in conservation, or the, the notion is certainly for practitioners. But terms like well-being, poverty, social impacts, governance rights, we've been working with those ideas for many, many years. And we have to show how they relate to each other. Otherwise, people will quite rightly say, you know, you're just coming up with another or another thing and fed up with all these frameworks. So the idea here is to try and um, show that relationship. And also, it brings us to our discussion in the discussion group about where, where, what, what stakeholders are accountable, or actors are accountable for for doing in terms of equity. So, I mean, this is a now I've only this is a sort of slight variation on on a, a diagram that's in this publication, understanding equity in protected area conservation. But uh, and I, I would like to get any feedback on, on it as to whether it makes any sense. But this is essentially a protected area which comprises a set of resources and also a management system and governance arrangements and these are the governance headings the major categories of governance in the IUCN the direction of performance fairness and rights legitimacy and voice and accountability around that is the management basically everything management does is guided by the governance or should be and and then it sits within the protected area. So protected area is not just a physical a bit of land with some resources and biodiversity and so on. It, it, we need to see it in this, in this sense. So having done that, this protected area is generating these social and, and conservation outcomes. Uh, the reason why they're overlapped is because a lot of what some people call conservation outcomes, other people would call social outcomes. And uh, we just have to accept there's a very fuzzy area there. We shouldn't worry too much about what we call it. In fact, almost all conservation outcomes are, in a sense, social outcomes. Uh, because ultimately, they all contribute to human well being and the quality of life on this planet at different levels from local, national up to global level. So, if that, in a sense, is how PAs contribute to well being, and this is, it's not an complete coincidence that this looks rather like the new IPBES in, in, into, uh, what's it called, Intergovernmental <laughs> Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services or Platform. It looks rather like their framework. So this is, if, you think, if we think about this, that we have a protected area, it has management going on by a range of different actors from government agencies to communities that is guided and um, shaped by governance it produces a set of outcomes which contribute to the quality of life at all different levels from local to global. So, um, when, we, when we look at these protected areas, and we, I, I'm trying to say here, just have a look at what it's like. Why it's quite got those things coming in and out. Anyway, management is essentially this bit here, as I said, the wrapper around governance. Governance are those five circles. And if we want to assess what governance look, is, looks like and what the quality is like, we've got to focus on those things and as, as, as we had in that earlier slide. Um, social outcomes and impacts are these, uh, this, this area here, and, and at least the work that we do tends to focus at the local level, but obviously protected areas have many benefits at the national level, particularly around some of the regulating ecosystem services. So if we're doing talking about assessing social impacts or outcomes, we've got to look at this and also ultimately how do these outcomes contribute to the quality of life of people in various scales. Um, now equity. So as I showed you with the mapping equity principles onto governance, uh, it's these three governance, main areas of governance, governance quality that it, uh, equity relates to. So that's what we want to look at. 
uh, in terms of equity. Um, but, so that's, if you like, the equity of governance. And I would argue that management is only equitable, or will not only be equitable, in, equitable insofar as governance is equitable, because in theory, governance, what happens, what managers do is depend on the policies and strategies that are defined by governance. So we talk a lot about, uh, in the IHE target, equitable management, but it's ultimately about equitable governance. So equitable governance, we would be focusing on those three things there. Um, arguably, if we talk about equitable equity of conservation, and Kate um, pointed out that there are often activities, this is why this says protected area and related activities, there are often activities associated with protected areas that are designed to support livelihoods of local people, for example, and they um, are also captured often under the same governance arrangements, and they contribute um, to social outcomes and, and to equity. So you could argue that equity, you could argue that equity is just about those three things, or you could argue and you could argue that it also is about the outcomes. So, for example, if you have a scheme for sharing tourism revenues, you could say it's um, about the fairness of the decision-making process and who's involved in that. Uh, it, that has to be equitable, but you, you will probably also want to look at actually what benefits were allocated to whom. Um, you could even argue that if the benefits are, say, bursaries for school children, which is really quite kind of common uh, benefit from revenue sharing, that you should be looking at whether that actually made a difference to the education of uh, children within that community. Uh, I'm, I'm actually making the case here that at the moment we don't really have even this. We don't have a, even a basic system to look at governance, uh, let alone these higher level things and anyway, that from a practical point of view um, it would be better to start with that lower this level and then get more ambitious at the time um, and just to point out so my arrow keeps disappearing but there are in this diagram there are some very important um, assumptions contained in this relationship here or uh, within this relationship so it in terms of how the protected area governance and management contributes to these outcomes. There are some critical things like people have a shared understanding of what, what is their interpretation of equity, that governance is actually as good as it seems. Often when you scratch the surface, it isn't half as good as it looks. Um, uh, that the decisions and plans that are being implemented have the expected outcome and that you don't have unexpected negative impacts. And a lot of governance can work and result in a lot of meetings that take a lot of time for community members who might be doing labor for someone earning some money. So there are, and here on this side, there are quite some major uh, assumptions here around how outcomes like giving bursaries to school children might uh, improve well-being, in this case, educational outcomes within communities around the park. A lot can go wrong within these two arrows. And so the danger of focusing only at this level on governance and saying equity is about this, is if these things don't work out right, then ultimately you're not going to achieve the impact. Um, and this relates to the discussion within the working group later on. So you could say a basic assessment of equity is conduct a governance assessment and focus on those three things, those circles. A more advanced version would be that basic plus do some social assessment, or if it's really a situation about rights and, and the issues are framed in terms of rights, you could do a rights, a human rights assessment in addition to your sort of basic assessment. So why is it important? And I mentioned some of this already, that in uh, going back to 1992 when the CBD was uh, first yeah. was developed and agreed, Sorry. okay, we, time, okay. time has yeah. been up. So okay. I just want to make sure we get to yeah, all Yeah, so I've, I've covered all this already, really, that it's now in the IHC targets, it's in the SDGs, and in the uh, CBD COP this year, it will be also in, in the form of a decision about governance and equity. In practice, there are always cited as two types of arguments for equity being important, a moral argument around poverty 
and the protected area shouldn't contribute to poverty and uh, human rights based argument. And then in the one that conservationists are more <coughs> concerned about and tend to be more critical of is the instrumental argument, which Kate referred to. The first one there is the one of our narratives that somehow um, a lack of income forces people to do commit to do illegal activities, and and therefore if you increase income, you might get um, uh, better conservation outcomes. And then the new one framed in terms of equity that this uh, sense of injustice and inequity that you find is, is also a driver of illegal activities. Um, yeah, I can. So the conclusion um, it, it is basically, the slide I just skipped through was about the experience in a particular protected area in Uganda where, where I worked and a lot of research has been done over the years in Windy and Penetrable National Park, which simply summarized in one sentence is that over the many, many years, there's been a strong focus on livelihoods and alternative livelihoods. And although that has been very successful, there is still there's a little reduction in illegal activities. And recent research showed that was around resentment. For example, with revenue sharing, a lot of money is given to communities. A lot of people, a lot of, there's a lot of elite capture. And a lot of people who get damaged from uh, wild animals get nothing. And that's causing a lot of anger in the community. And so, Equity, if we focus less on the total volume of benefits and more on the equity of, in the way that benefits are distributed, we would have better outcomes, both in terms of social outcomes and conservation outcomes. And that's and just an example of why the shift, that shift in, in the framing of the social dimension of conservation from livelihoods to equity may well give us better, as I said, social conservation outcomes. Thank you, Phil. I think you've given us a, a lot to marinate on and definitely not an easy path forward, but maybe even shifting of perspective of how that can inform kind of the path forward. I will take a pause and take some questions for Phil if people have them right now as we transition to our last presenter, who is actually the U Camus, the Social Science Initiative Manager here at Conservation International School, is going to actually stop and say looking at protected areas. Are they effective? What is data telling us? Are there other tools in our toolbox we should be thinking of? Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll kind of give our presenters a chance to answer these questions. So does anyone have one they'd like to put in the pot for Phil? And we can also, you can, I will also give you a chance to pick up when we come back to plenary. So if you don't have one at the moment, you can say, let me marinate. Oh, yeah. Just, um, Phil, maybe if you could also do a minute and I'll talk a little bit about some of the practical um, experience that you've had in applying the framework and what's come out of that and um, what it implies for some of the levels of the projects that are being investigated. Thank you. That's a great question. And with that, do you are you ready? So before we head into the Q&A discussion, I'm going to take everyone a huge step back and look at what's going on with all the project years globally. Um, on behalf of the team, I'm going to present our data and some preliminary findings from the work on protected area downgrading, downsizing, and examine, as well as some initial findings around uh, conservation beyond protected areas. <clears throat> so I assume everyone here is pretty familiar with protected areas. Whether you like it or not, we kind of assume that protected area is something we're putting onto the space and it's protected and it will stay there a long time, ideally forever or not ideally, it depends on what's your perspective. But we've also seen cases, well, why is it? Um, but we've also seen cases that happening in very biodiverse areas, terrestrial and coastal, and uh, other places and right here in this country where there are changes, legal changes happen to protect the areas, either their boundaries were shrinked uh, or the extra activities were allowed or the whole protection will get removed. That said, a part protected once is not protected forever. Um, and to systemically understand what exactly happened when people want to get rid of protected area or some of the restrictions, or part of it, uh, we started this research initiative a while ago looking at protected area downgrading, downsizing, and de We all know what is a protected area. 
And by downgrade, we were looking at all those legal changes that removed or relaxed some of the restrictions on what type of human activities can be allowed in this protected area. By downsizing, we look at changes that shrink the boundary of the protected area. And by dig examine, that means the whole protected area is just removed, loses all legal protect, protect status. And while there's all those protected areas and something's happening to the protected areas, it's not just about protected or not protected. There are also a bunch of other area based approaches going on outside of protected areas, like you've mentioned a little bit on indigenous land, community based uh, approaches, and a bunch of others. So, I don't know why it's moving it. <laughs> oh, my uh, so anyway, so here are <laughs> those questions. <laughs> I think Maybe the so slides know that we are out of time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sometimes it gets, it gets set on a timer. Yeah, yeah. it's on a timer. It's on a timer. Okay. Yeah, let's, see. let's see. Can we get rid of the timer? You um, can stay on that slide set and just show okay. the outline, and sure. the timer will be uh, stopped. Sure. So basically, for, for the path research, we were trying to understand the patterns, the trend, and the causes of all those decisions. Uh, why they happened, what are the risks, and what are the impacts of those pet decisions. And as for beyond protected areas, because we haven't really know as much about them, the initial step is to try to understand what, where they are now, when they started, and does they last longer or shorter, or, does they, or do they actually last? Um, and here are some results. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so for enacted pet event, um, Okay, I, I, I guess step back to talk about how we do the data collection. Basically, for global data collection, we've been doing opportunistic data collection by people reporting to us. We kind of search on news and internet. And for a few countries, we've done comprehensive legal review, looking through their legal archives to see what are those legal decisions happen to protect the errors. And over the past few years, we have identified over 3,000 cases uh, where a legal action was taken to had a PA, and over 2,000 of them are downgrade decisions, about 600 were downsizes, and over 300 were dig examines when the protected area was removed. Um, and this is how it looks like on the map. As you've seen, in some countries we have better data, more comprehensive data, and in some countries we don't have it. Uh, and I do want to emphasize this should not be seen as a comprehensive global situation because the data collection effort is biased. And this is definitely an underestimate just because we haven't covered all the countries and through the whole history of protected areas. And in terms of trends, uh, we definitely have seen more activities happening in recent years, either because there were more PAs there for us to pad or because we have more data to um, look at in recent years, or likely because of the pressure of economic development or population growth and a bunch of other reasons, maybe there are actually more pet events happening in recent years. And if we look at the proximate causes, this is interesting because we've been talking about the conflicts between PAs and development. We can take a look um, at what causes actually will lead to legal changes to relax the restrictions. So we found that most of the causes that lead to legal changes were industrial scale, resource extraction, or development. Uh, F refers to forestry, mining, oil and gas, industrial scale agriculture, industrialization, infrastructure, this huge spike, if you notice this 200, and I make that part shorter just because there's too many infrastructure related decisions. MC is multiple causes, where there are multiple causes. And uh, decisions related to local um, development and land claim were actually much uh, fewer. So LC refers to land claims, RS is rural settlement, and there's also a lot of events related to subsistence, which is granting people rights to do subsistence um, resource collection in protected areas. And because it's only allowing extra activities, most of them were downgrade, not necessarily downsizing or decadement. Um, only a small number of them were related to degradation of a protected area or conservation planning aiming to reshuffle things for better conservation outcome. Always others. 
And there were a lot of unknown stuff that leads to a bunch of downsides and several decontaminants, but people just didn't say why they decided to make those changes. And if you look at how all those causes uh, happened over time, um, yeah, pretty much more um, had in recent years. Uh, you do see a plateau at the end of the, like after 2012, but I think it's because most of our data collection happened between 2000, uh, before 2012. So it's probably still growing there. And as we've seen, there's a lot of infrastructure and industrial agriculture related to that. Um, so in 2016, we use all the tropical, all the pad events happening, tropical areas that we are aware of to do a risk analysis, trying to figure out uh, in what conditions they are more likely to be padded. And we do find that protected areas with larger size and are closer to population center are those that are most likely to be padded. Um, however, we recently look, uh, zoomed in to look at the specific case in Rondonia, Brazil, where all the um, pad events were related to rural settlement and um, hydro development. And we found that like, the performance of the protected area actually affects the likelihood of a pad decision. Even within one protected area, we've seen that areas that has been historically heavily deforested, when the chance came, uh, they are more likely to be thrown away, while the other parts that were more intact, they actually were integrated into other protected areas or even like um, upgraded to a more restricted version. Um, because we have seen pad happen in different countries uh, under different local contexts due to different causes, it's understandable that we've seen very different impact of PAD events as well. Uh, according to a research in 2014, we found there were four countries that if they haven't padded any of their protected areas, they would have already uh, achieved their RHE target one, um, but they failed to because of some PAD event. Um, in Peru and Peninsula Malaysia, we do find that PAD accelerated deforestation and carbon emission. But that didn't happen in Brazil, partly because we noted that a lot of deforestation happened before that legal de decision uh, to pad the protected area. And we also find uh, in Yosemite Park that had accelerated um, habitat fragmentation. However, part of the padded area were reprotected years later, and the reprotection actually um, slowed that fragmentation. So that's why mitigation would also work in this situation. Uh, in case you guys are curious, there's the website. You can look at all the PAD data and why they happened and when they happened. So we've gone through all those events that happened to PAD, uh, all those PAD-related events, and now we are take a quick look on what's going on beyond protected areas. Uh, we did a quick fuzzy definition on um, what we count in. So it's hard to draw the line, so we decided to be comprehensive rather than Throwing out things. So basically, we look at all the area based uh, approaches uh, where you have a boundary and there are some restrictions on land re or resource use or access that either aims on conservation or has some actual conservation outcomes. And here are a bunch of things we were looking at, including indigenous land, CBRM, but also other private focused stuff like. Uh, easement, private, privately protected areas, and we also have uh, conservation concessions, certification, and other things here. So that's a lot of things. So we only focus that the, the Amazonia countries and take a quick look on what data tell us. Um, and we found like about the same area is covered by all the things we've identified as has been covered by state designated state protected areas. So it's like 20% covered by PAs and 20% covered by other stuff in the Amazonia region a lot. Uh, one other thing interesting is, so this is what each country has under all those categories. So different countries have been, uh, has been using quite different approaches, but because we have been focusing on a PA, non-PA world, they kind of shuffle different things to WDPA, 
reported to WDPA as their progress to achieve a I2 target or whatever it is. Um, so that actually created some challenge for us to accurately understand what's our progress, what has been protected, and where are the places we should actually be working on. So in general, this is the way more dynamic landscape and way more complex landscape than we have imagined as error protected, error not protected, error protected now and forever and ever to error, but like error protected now, it can be unprotected in the future. And with that, these are okay. It's happening again. Right. So we'll back to Thank you. Uh, uh, can we go back to one slide? So with that, th there are some um, take-home messages I want to share. It's, the first thing is protected areas are not necessarily protected forever. Um, had has been happening, it has been widespread, it has been patchy, it's not just something happened historically, it's also happening now. And the causes and impacts differ a lot as well, and there's a lot to study. And while we were looking at all those problems and promises by PA, we should also realize that there are, um, still at the other slide, sorry. <laughs> there, there, there are, uh, thank you. There are, there, there are other tools in the toolbox that we should consider. And there's a lot of remain unknowing. Like, for example, we just discussed, we've been looking at all those biodiversity outcomes, but we don't quite know what happened with the social and human well-being side of it. So we need a lot of research to actually understand what's going on, the durability, the equity side, and the um, just side of the story of all those tools, not just PA. Um, and as for, can we move that? Yeah. So as we have discussed, governance not only shape the ecology as PA putting or not, it will shape the land use land um, cover outcome. The change of the land use land cover outcome will actually shape people's decision on governance as well. And we really need to understand the extent of and durability of other stuff so we can know what is best suitable for the places we want to intervene and what can be uh, most helpful in terms of to conservation and to local livelihood. Um, and in effective analysis, we should probably consider both PAD and BPAs, because if you're looking at the effectiveness of PAD, uh, of PAs, then there are a lot of unsuccessful PAs just disappeared. You kind of get a biased result on what, how effective PAs are. And at the same time, if you ignored all the other things happening beyond PAs, what are you actually comparing your PA with? Um, and as of, well, I, I think that should be part of the discussion, but there are some thoughts that we have based on our research and experiences. We think most important thing at this moment is we are talking about cases uh, and experiences but what exactly is going on? The first step is to accurately monitor, track, and report all those decisions, either on PAD or on BPA happening on the ground. So that's the first step to understand where things have changed. And when you understand where things have, have has changed, you would be able to try to figure out what's the true trade-offs we're dealing with. None of this could happen before we actually know what's going on. Um, and and we do want to have, uh, we, we think we, if we want that change to happen, you definitely want to have uh, a transparent and accountable policy to governing all those changes. And uh, talking about mitigation hierarchy, um, we talked about the mitigation on social side um, and of course on the ecological or conservation side, there should, uh, we should consider and mitigate all those um, potential harm to conservation and probably consider reprotect or restore something that already happened. And as of for other area-based conservation, um, I think as you have mentioned, it's important to recognize their contribution and recognize the existing effort. And by bringing that recognized, we kind of also improve the intention and well-being of people um, committed to that mission. Uh, while they were not necessarily using protected area. 
Um, and for, on the policy and international negotiation side, it's important to create the space and the capacity for people to implement the most durable and justice and suitable uh, and sustainable conservation intervention that good for them and good for nature. And I know that's an ideal world, but that's it. Uh, this is the work of a lot of people, a lot of people, <laughs> um, papers, and thank you. <laughs> Technology leaps alone. That was you handled that really, really <laughs> spectacularly. Okay. Hold on, Al, can we just? Yeah. So I'm gonna get a chance to get clarifying questions for you, and then we'll bring our. If in the meantime, if the panelists could just maybe drag a chair up to the front, so we can answer the questions that we have, and maybe even dive a little deeper. I know I have one to ask of the entire panel, but a question for for CU as we kind of transition into. Um, thank you very much. It's really interesting research. And just in the discussion, I wonder if you could um, just explain a little bit more, unpack a little bit the category of um, downgraded, and in particular in the case where um, the the reason was for either recognition or expansion of subsistence access. If if it's a shift in the protected areas management category to allow for subsistence use. Is that considered like a downgrade, or is the downgrade based on sort of conservation effectiveness, or just yeah, what what it means to for particularly be downgraded sure. in the context of subsistence access? Okay, I say no. No, I'm actually going to rewind and take okay. us back to the and take us back to the beginning because Adrian, we started off with your presentation and yes, Kate, would you mind just sort of because people want to look at you, not at me. I promise. Um, we started with sort of like looking at human rights and what the conservation organization is doing and what this is connected to actually global instruments, right? Like we've heard a lot of references to the Aichi targets, the process of, re of kind of looking to the next 10 years and, and those goals, but really the sustainable development goals are the ones that we're all sort of for best wor working on together that's really presented as integrated framework. How, what's the relationship of an effort like CIHR to the SDGs? Uh, well, I have to preface that by saying that the SDGs are not my area of expertise either. Um, and allergies disappeared. <laughs> but his team actually, where um, CI is actually working right now um, on a policy um, for uh, governments to demonstrate um, how achieving IG target, uh, no, sorry, how achieving the SDGs can um, benefit or um, harm uh, environmental outcomes. So we're hoping to actually work with policymakers to link the um, post-2020 goals of the CBD to the sustainable development goals so that both can be achieved at the same time. Um, because I think all of us who work in the policy realm recognize that governments, most governments in the world don't have the capacity to meet the goals they've already um, assigned on to in various different international conventions. So how to make it easier for governments um, by showing them that there are connections to human well-being um, under the SDGs and um, post-2020 goals that the CBD is hoping to draft. So we're actually working really closely with several governments um, and there's been a few pilots already um, I don't know if you remember where, but Rwanda maybe, and Uganda. like Uganda and Liberia. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're doing um, with policymakers to actually link these things together. And then, so that takes us to our next question, which was for Kate. And um, Kate, I'm actually going to leave the protected areas, how we define it, and all of that, where it is, because I think you can see you touched on it in their presentation. So we might get into that in just a second. But um, you, you presented sort of myths and sort of tenants that we've all held in conservation. Um, and, and the question was about failures in conservation schemes and specifically even the overselling of the benefits or awesomeness of protected areas for people. Is Do you think that's part of the reason why we're seeing conservation failures or is any of the evidence sort of pointing at that particularly strongly? Um, I actually thought, you know, there's quite a gap that would be nice to fill between my presentation and, and yours here because I, I I think that is quite interesting and I'm not quite sure what happens to the ones that are failing very clearly um, for a lot of people like these WMAs in Tanzania which are now I think they've just about hit their 20th anniversary 
Um, and so, you know, if they're not doing well, there's a lot of resistance going on in terms of conservation outcomes. I imagine that they would soon end up, you know, in a situation where they're so degraded that they might easily then end up in a pad downsizing situation. But it would be quite interesting, I think, to actually do that. And as you were saying, you haven't done enough on the data collection on the social outcomes to understand how much those then actually need to you know, downgrading. And, and um, I don't think I've got the answer on that either. I, I wanted to come back just briefly to the SDG question. We've, we've also in ESPA been looking at, um, we haven't quite got to the end of this analysis yet, but looking at um, all the papers that we've produced across ESPA and those that look at the SDGs, the majority focus on the poverty SDG because that's what ESPA is about. But interestingly enough, um, a lot of them also focus on one or more other SDGs, and the, the one that comes up very high as, as the second one is the life on Earth. So, you know, of all the other SDGs, that's the one that seems to be, you know, most closely linked to the, the poverty one, perhaps inevitably because of the nature of our program that kind of links the two. But, um, you know, there's, there's potential there. For me personally, I think that, you know, the SDGs, it's a shame that they are in silos and that really one, one needs to think in the future of a much more integrated social ecological system where um, you know, the, the land use approaches that we have more broadly uh, actually tackle all of those things together. That actually takes us to Phil and, and so speak of practical experiences specifically in applying the, the framework that you presented, um, looking at an equity perspective. Um, and the question was if you could touch on that, especially in reference to life just, just one, word, one thing to what Kate said, I was in UNDP the other day in New York and they have a, quite a big effort to look at how the, the principle of leave no one behind applies as a cross-cutting principle. So rather than having an SDG on the just on inequality, so they're trying to push every group that has interest in, in, in different goals to think about how they would apply that cross-cutting principle. Uh, and there's kind of a, an opportunity there to bring in a like, sort of equity, justice, uh, well-being perspective into every principle through that as that gathers momentum, assuming it does gather some more momentum. Uh, to answer the question that uh, uh, Jess asked, um, yes, so that's really all of our work on this, what looks like rather, rather theoretical stuff, is based on practical um, methods for assessing social impact of protected areas, which is called social impact of protected area assessment. Social, uh, assessment, sorry, social assessment of protected areas, uh, based on that manual there, and a similar process for assessing the quality of governance of protected areas, which has a manual like this, which will be produced in about six weeks. And, so that work we've done in a number of sites, about 10 sites, each one at the moment, but they're being sort of rolled out to other sites now. And uh, particularly the governance assessment gives us a very uh, clear picture also of the equity issues, but as I said, it depends whether you, if you regard equity as largely a governance issue, then the governance assessment is giving us a, a very interesting picture on that. If you regard it as something that also that goes to a higher level and that you have to be concerned about uh, social outcomes, for example, educational, the impact on educational performance of investments of parks in education, then uh, you need social assessment as well to help you answer that question. Uh, but we have done this and we are, what we're doing with these two, although they, they're kept separate because some protected areas really want to look at social impacts. And governance may be either something they don't think is very important or they're scared of because it can reveal quite a lot of tricky political issues. So some will start with social assessment, some that have maybe already done something like that will be a bit more adventurous and go for governance. But what is common to all of them is a basic tool of a sort of scorecard, which you could call an equity scorecard. We're also working with the group WCMC and some others to try and to make that a standalone thing that could be used as a simple tool across many different protected areas. It doesn't have a very good process, but it's like MET. Anyone's familiar with all projected area management effectiveness assessments? They, they're a scorecard, 
the quality is, is about the process that's used. But even if it's not a very good process and it's just two or three people sitting down thinking about it, it's better than nothing. So there are various ways in which this is sort of rolling out uh, and it's tools to assess social impacts, governance and equity, sort of cheap and cheerful kind of equity assessment too. Thank you. So you used your question about downgrade and then the sort of what downgrade it is in, in pad terms and maybe the question kind of hinting at is, is, is that really bad or is that necessarily just a change of use and just could that fall into the other PA categories and if I'm pulling on your right. question appropriately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is one thing that we have been always emphasizing, but I kind of wrong with it because uh, that's we. So when we do this pad work, we were not necessarily saying pad is good or bad because it's really context based, based on the cost, it's based on how the PA is now and who benefited from that decision. Um, like granting subsistence use, so that huge spike. I think there are two major events related to that. Why is the recent decision um, by um, U.S. that allow traditional use of medicine plants by Native Americans in all the national parks? And I, we think it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, well, other people may think it's different. I don't know. I cannot speak for everyone. Um, there's another case which happened in India, which is a little bit controversial. Um, because the government said that bamboos used to be timber that cannot be, like you cannot harvest timber from protected areas in India, but then they recategorize it as non-timber products, so you can harvest bamboos from protected areas. Um, and some people see that might lead to some habitat issue in protected areas, which it probably depends on what's the magnitude. Uh, human activities on that. So it's complex, but when we see pad, it's not as very good or bad. Yes. So a couple more questions from the floor, maybe before we put you to work. I saw a hand here, hand there, three. Okay. Okay, so a couple of questions and observations. So to answer the original question. I'll see if I'm <laughs> <laughs> I remember happy, happy hours, what I'm aiming for. <laughs> right. Remember what I work for before you <laughs> stop me. So, um, okay, so um, the first, uh, okay, yes, you just covered pretty much everything under the sun in the 17 areas that um, they focus on. So the answer is, but to the question is probably yes, that do cover whatever the original question was. Um, 175 you know, targets under that. Um, very quickly, I would like really, I would really like to know more about the work you're doing on SDGs and uh, governments and I wanted to ask you which governments, which type of governments are you, which countries, you know, OECD countries, developing, you know, countries, low income, middle income, which regions. Uh, in the scope of that, I am designing, I'm in the process, very, very early stages of uh, designing a new program, which follow on, will follow on for my spot. And um, I, I will convene a thinking group at some point. Okay, is definitely going to be in it. I already shared the news with that recently, and and it will be good to have that kind of information as possible. And this new program will look at the uh, you know build on the research and the evidence we delivered on the ESPA, but will also look at issues of conservation, protected areas as well as of course the more traditional. And so if it is interested in so SDG one, two, and three, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, they leave no one behind the agenda. It made me laugh because that is one of the key themes we are following in the at the moment. Our last retreat the, in Bristol, the team was leave no one behind. See? Thank you, Elizabeth. Responses from the panel right now, because we do have more questions pending. Sure. Um and I might ask Alec to actually speak about the SD work. Is that, could you speak a little more about Rowan? Or is that something you want to pick up during happy hour? Because because yeah, his, his team is actually the experts on, on the work, so yeah. I can't there, answer there's actually a, all of the quite questions. There's a bit of stuff going on in that work. But. Yeah, there's a lot of. So I don't know, Alec, if you just briefly want to share. I, 
what, con what countries you've done the pilot testing in. Um, sure. and, and I just gave like one sentence overview, maybe you can give a two sentence overview. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, uh, no problem. So our team works on the global policy framework, including the SDGs. And so we're, we piloted a rapid, um, rapid assessment tool that looks at what, na what nature is needed to achieve um, particular SDGs. And we did that in um, Liberia, and we're looking to expand that into other countries as well. We've also created a tool that, that links multiple uh, the global frameworks together. So um, what nature is needed to achieve the SDGs, and then how will that also help you achieve the Aichi targets, as well as the um, Africa Agenda 2063 goals, and, um, and also the National Climate Commitments, the NPCs. So trying to look at what nature is needed as the fundamental to achieve some of the SDG targets, and then how achieving those SDGs can um, then also help you achieve some of the other global frameworks as well. So can you explain what you mean by what nature is needed? Mm -hmm. This is quite an unusual way of using that term. Sure. If you don't mind. No, yeah. So meaning more broadly, right, about what types of ecosystems and their services are then needed to achieve water security or food security in any particular area, um, as an example. But we're using nature quite broadly here. But when I say nature, I'm talking about the ecosystems and the services that they provide to the communities, the nations, to achieve their goals. Yeah. And draws on ecosystem services mapping that CI has led out of our more Center for Science, correct? Yeah. Which we can, we, if anyone is curious, we can add a little more kind of concrete on. on on, on what that the or can connect, connect that to uh, the people doing the research. Yep, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Question in the corner and then one in the front. I just just for time wise, I, I've got about like a five minutes compressing because I we really do want to put you all to work mm. and we've got a goal in mind for you. So I was um, just scratch the, the <laughs> we're small enough group. Oh. There's still work to be done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question. Um, this might be a happy hour question too, um, but this is directed to you. Um, so in your map, you said you, that, uh, you don't have a lot of the data. And then in your, um, in your conclusion, you said you're looking to monitor and track more of that data on the ground. How are you, look, how are you uh, looking to build that capacity on the ground where you do have to look there? And um, yeah, in terms of gathering more data, what are you looking to um, how are you building the more capacity in the ground to do that? Um, so to review historical decision, what we have been doing is, so last year we actually did a regional training workshop in the Amazonia countries, and we trained the local expert, and they go out and look through their national archive to do a systemic data collection, so we can have a comprehensive and systemic, um, comprehensive and comparable data for those countries. And we were thinking of duplicate that effort in other regions. So there's local capacity who understand PEP, understand local context, understand local PA governance. And those will help us build data for what happened before. And in terms of future, of course, this should not be something sitting in CI by a three, five people team trying to understand all those decisions we've had. But once we have the capacity, and maybe there can be something happening at the CBD negotiation, and if that can be a requirement at national level, maybe the country government should be the one keeping track of what they have been, what changes they have been made to their contact areas. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. 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 One. Uh, what is a protected area? Uh, that is different than ESPA protected areas. And, and so we need to be real careful about when we say uh, a myth about protected areas uh, may or may not be true. But the question is for US, uh, for US conservation research, one of our challenges is how, uh, how our research has impacted, uh, resulted in changes. And Phil had the example of uh, uh, 
contributions to international dialogue and findings of ESPA uh, reflected in, in uh, more recent uh, stuff. But I'd be interested at, uh, at Cocktail or, or, or now on uh, examples of uh, what impacts, uh, development impacts or conservation impacts, uh, how the research has uh, changed behavior institutional behavior or conservation behavior? I think there's a mixture of that. So obviously yeah, the, research, the, the research projects themselves, um, some of them have had a, a direct impact in those areas. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the policy briefs there is, is on the, the Pima project that's been working in Tanzania, looking at these WMAs. And in fact, they've been working with USAID there, uh, who were, uh, I think, in the, the process of re reframing their policy as to what to do with WMAs, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing that the you know, situation wasn't ideal. So a lot of the research findings there fed into that process. So you know that's an example in Madagascar. The same has been very active engagement with mm -hmm. uh, the managers and the and the, the government on um, how that sort of protected area is, is managed. And uh, with the Abata V mine, there is now follow up yeah. work there with companies, in fact, um, to look at the standards that they apply to make them less ambiguous about uh, the fact that it's not just the people who are affected by the mine footprint itself, but also people who are affected by the offset that needs to be um, considered and properly compensated. So I think uh, at the project level, um, you know, there are attempts to have development impacts, but it's, it all depends on the relationships with local partners and we've done a lot of separate work within ESPER on programmatic learning and on what helps to get science into impact which cuts across not just the protected area work but everything else and, and we have uh, a kind of policy brief on that and a working paper that's not quite ready yet but will be out on our website <laughs> it is already in the past tense as you pointed out earlier um, in a few weeks time uh, so you know I, that's what I could say and, and at the you know at the program level um, this is the kind of event we're trying to do and trying to yeah. get information out to, to people who care about particular aspects mm -hmm. uh, of our work. And I guess Phil already mentioned as well that you know we're, we already have all of this equity work is, is now in one of the documents going to the next CBD right. substar, uh, which is a kind of a preliminary decision then going to, to the CBD, which would mean that uh, in fact almost verbatim some of our word on, word, wording on it, it would be taken up by governments, which which would be great because that would give them justification for them to spend some money and effort and train people to actually look at the equity of not just their individual protected areas but whole protected area systems as well. It actually sets us up quite well for the question that we would like others to to contribute into the group discussion. So maybe what I'll do is, Bill, you had said you wanted to do the kind of set up charge to action, and then we're going to ask you to kind of break into the music. I don't know why it's doing that. Somebody's got a question. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to ask you to break out into the smaller groups and we'll distribute um, flip chart papers and pens to help record your thoughts. Um, and we're going to come back and report back maybe as we start off our, our happy hour. So are there questions on that? And for, for those of you online, we really appreciate your participation and, and listening in. Um, but after we transition to breakout groups, I think logistics in the room and online participation become too much of a challenge. And if you have thoughts, um, we'll find a way to, 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 to so drop a, a comment in your chat and we'll, uh, we'll pass it on to the organizers. How many people are there? Six? There's six. We could have one person sit here and do the chat. Yeah. So we we'll take the chat. <laughs> Depends how, how uh, dedicated people are going to be. <laughs> Can I say a few words just? Please, Bill, if you could add. In the context that, as we said, the notion of equity is increasingly uh, present in the CBD uh, decisions in the SDGs. At the moment, it's sort of there's not much uh, opposition. People have generally said, oh, that sounds like a good thing. It's there in IG Target 11, even though no one really understood what it meant. But there's going to be pushback, undoubtedly, from people. And they're going to say, well, what does that mean exactly? 
And if I'm supposed to recognize and respect rights, what does that mean? And if I'm supposed to mitigate negative impacts of, of crop damage, wildlife conflict, does that mean I just have to try and do something, or I actually have to guarantee no harm to well-being, which is I can't possibly do. And if you're saying I, it's no harm to anybody's well-being, forget about it. I'm not into this equity thing. So being clearer about what is the duty or obligation of the duty bearers or, or, or uh, to um, in promoting or buying into equitable management and governance uh, is, is going to be an issue. And I, want, I sort of floated that as something to discuss in here because I know that in the next six months we're going to be getting the people asking that question and it'll be the, the reason it, it gets watered down and even maybe kicked out of some of the international policy discussion mm -hmm. because pe people that can't, don't understand their sort of liability, if you like, mm -hmm. what, it, what it actually means. And I mean, to be fair to the conservation movement, it's all very well to say, yeah, do no harm. We kind of 10 years ago lobbied for the do no harm principle in the CBD, and it's sort of fair. It says you should never exacerbate poverty. Well, we know that conservation exacerbates poverty. And it's not realistic to say you should never do so. It can't, you can't stop a boons jumping over a fence and damaging someone's crop. You can make a really big effort to try and reduce it, but you can't stop it. So that kind of discussion about if we're going to really do a push on equity and justice uh, in the mainstream of conservation, we've also got to have a discussion about where that sort of, in, in a theory of change kind of language, we talk about an accountability ceiling. What is it? realistic to expect people to buy into and commit to and what is really beyond that. But I mean, you could take that conversation in any direction you like, but that's kind of what that's about. Not only who should, who should be held accountable, but at what level or to what extent mm -hmm. should they be held accountable for equitable conservation or do no harm or respecting, recognizing and respecting rights or even protecting or fulfilling rights. So on a process point, I'm gonna give us I'm gonna, I think maybe we're, we're large enough to, for at least three or four groups. Two, two groups, all right, Kate, okay, you win. Um, for, for two groups to, to chew on that, and I'm gonna actually ask our presenters to split themselves between the two groups um, to help keep the conversation going. I'll pass out flip charts. I'll give people about 15 minutes, which will not be sufficient, but to see if we're at least ready to come back and start kind of sharing some initial thoughts with each other. And if not, I will grant you five more minutes before um, I'll at least give us a chance to, to round up and share some final thoughts before 5 p.m., just in case there are others who have to have to leave. And um, everyone clear on the, the sort of charges, the spoiler groups, it probably makes sense to put the groups around each of the tables and I'll pass out flip charts and markers as you get started. <coughs>